Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. Last month, I had the lead developer of the Arklands campaign setting on the Monastery, designed for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Now, Arklands as a setting is fascinating to, to me for its take on a returning magic in a Bronze Age-esque setting. The playtest material was recently released, and I jumped on the chance to take a look. Now, I won't be doing this as a full review, as my primary interest in covering the playtest was the spellforging system, primarily, and the use of classes as a secondary. Plus, well, it's a playtest. However, due to how the casting classes work, I need to cover the classes in the playtest first. What immediately strikes me is the fact that, unlike classes in the player's handbook, the classes here are not afraid of choice. Consider how every base class in the player's handbook for 5th edition is reliant on the subclass features that are learned on a set path chosen at 3rd or 2nd level, depending on the class. The knight, for example, has a set of knightly deeds from an order they can learn. While the beginning and end are set, known as the first deed and the master deed, the remaining ones can be taken in any order, and not all will be able to be taken. That said, I'm iffy on some classes having blank entries on features. The other classes don't have as much de as depth as the knight, but I'd imagine that's the product of it being an alpha. Instead of spellcasting classes, magic is treated as a subclass that replaces the class features the base class had at that level. In this regard, it's got more in common with the class customizations of Pathfinder than the built-in subclasses of D&D 5th Edition. Now, only two casting classes are shown in the playtest, the Vowbinder and the Tome Bearer. Effectively, these two are Arklin's answer to the Sorcerer and Wizard, respectively. This is because Vowbinders have a familiar that grows with them, while the Tome Bearer may utilize better control of the glyphs that are used for spell forging. Now, speaking of which, let's talk about the spell forging system. You see, there's no spell list per se. Instead, PCs have to create spells based on a series of glyphs. These glyphs cost fate points that are gained based on level. A spell is based on the following components. Target, effect, effect value, duration, and action. To build an example Burning Hands-like spell, we would use the following glyph array. Kon, Tyr, Bane, Sofans, and Nishan. Essentially, a 15-foot cone that deals fire damage with a d6 damage type, cast instantaneously with an action. This spell would cost 5 fate points to forge. A third level tome binder could cast this spell at first level two times per day. As an aside, it's really confusing to have character level and spell level in the same conversation, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's no set levels for the spells themselves, just the level you cast them in. In the case of this spell, casting it at a higher level would merely increase the spell's difficulty, class, and damage. Enchantment, or applying glyphs onto items, operates on a similar approach. However, since it requires the use of gold as a magical conductor, there's a GP cost as well as a cost in fate points. Within enchantment, the fate point and gold cost varies depends on what's being enchanted, as well as its target, effect, effect value, duration, and uses, much like spellforging. Suppose instead that we created a longsword that could deal fire damage once per day. In this case, the glyph array would be Tarzigil, Tyr, Bane, Sofans, and Aumno totaling 6 FP and totaling 2,000 GP. This means that once per day, the sword could add 1d6 fire damage to a successful attack. I like the setup here, but what I'm curious about is whether or not there's going to be alternative means of gaining FP through play in the book. At the very least, the game avoids D&D's quadratic wizards problem by capping spells at level 6, and making it so non-casting characters can still get some use out of the glyph system. There's clearly a lot of work to be done, but this is a fine start to show what they intend to do with the system. One that I look forward to see how it develops.